Welcome everyone to a very special Record Club episode of the Jams and Tea podcast. We are two down today, as you will have already noticed, uh, Jake and Sersha are not joining us for this review, um, but the three of us still are going to do our damnedest to do justice to a very special album, uh, obviously an artist that is hugely podcast core, um, basically because of me, um, but we have reviewed them uh, three times in the past. We reviewed Orteker's uh, last two new release records that came out uh, in the latter half of 2020, Sign and Plus. And we also have done them on Record Club before. We did a Record Club episode mm. on LP5, one of the earliest Record Club episodes that we did. And so I, I believe that that does make Orteker our most are artists with the most individual episodes on them now so I, I suppose you're right yeah thinking on it yeah we episode have segments how yeah you put it. yeah i think we we you you must be right i haven't thought about it but yeah what's interesting about this or about um the fact that this is happening is that when because the lp5 record club review that we did was the second record club uh that i suggested because we obviously for our listeners who may not know uh the five of us each um select a record club um one at a time each week and rotate until yeah there's a uh, there's a five week cycle basically and so Orteker was the second artist i wanted to cover under record club but i had a really awful time picking the album that i wanted us to talk about and he ended up being a coin flip between lp5 and confield the fifth and sixth or ticker albums i think they're both really important albums to the narrative of or ticker as well as perhaps less discussed than your classic your tri repetes for instance um so we did lp5 um and that was a really good review i think we really got to the heart of that record but i think confield is a, a kind of an album we sort of have had to review at a certain point like especially considering how often we end up sort of talking about idm and electronic music in one way or another and especially about like boundary pushing artists and stuff like that um but the reason we're doing this now is not just because hey you know let's just do it for the sake of it it's because confield on the day we record this is celebrating its 20th birthday uh, it was released on the 30th of april 2001 and uh it's I think fair to say that regardless of where you fall on this record, I mean, spoiler alert, the three of us are all pretty considerable fans of it. Uh, but regardless of where you fall on this record, it's difficult to deny that it, there's really nothing else that sounds like it. it even for Orteca at, their, at that juncture in their career, um, at the start of the 2000s, they had really never released anything prior that uh, sounded quite the way that this has it was quite a pivot away from even lp5 which was this very kind of janky sounding heavily percussive record um, that itself was a, a huge pivot away from its own predecessor um so we're this is kind of this juncture in, in autica's career where with each successive album they're advancing their sound in an unexpected way and confield i think is the most dr dramatic of those advancements um, but it's not even just a dramatic progression or a dramatic step forward within the discography of Orteker. It's a dramatic record within the context of IDM. I mean, obviously IDM had a massive um, and significant boom. It was a, a, a huge um, subcultural um, style of music in the 90s. I mean, you had your Aphex Twins and your Boards of Canada's and your Square Pushers, those kind of classic acts. Um, interestingly, um, all of whom we reviewed except for Boards of Canada. We will have to talk about them at some point. Yeah, that's uh, that's um, something we must correct. But but yeah, so it was very much this um, phenomenon in the 90s. And I think that reached its saturation point in the late 90s when Aphex Twin effectively crossed over into the mainstream with a series of successful singles and became essentially the, the modern face of electronic music. And Orteker were and have since always remained much less interested in the spotlight, much less interested in, I guess, their own place in the cultural zeitgeist. They are quite content to sit outside of it and just relentlessly plug forward within their own unique niche. Um, with each successive release, it feels like 
or Tigger have um, differentiated themselves or pushed themselves further from any relevant, any kind of comparable um, artists. I mean, yeah. there are some exceptions, I think, in the later career of Ortega, uh, records like Oversteps and records like the recent Sign and Plus have definite, I think, antecedents and artists like One Tricks Point Never, for instance. But at this juncture in Ortega's career throughout the 2000s, but particularly this early 2000s period, they were carving a lane that was really uh, distancing for a lot of people for a lot of listeners and I think the reason why you do hear a lot about records like Tri Repetite and you hear a lot about records like um, Square Pushers first three records and Go Plastic and Boards of Canada and um, a lot of those kind of key records in that time in the early 90s is that they managed in some way whether directly or indirectly to tap into some aspect of the zeitgeist of that sound whereas Orteker almost presented as though they were deliberately trying to be alienating and I think that was something that a lot of critics um, and a lot of people in music journalism and a lot of general music listeners um, at that time in the late 90s and particularly after particularly from Confield onwards in the 2000s really had a difficult time understanding or enjoying or accepting and um, uh, there was definitely a sense, um, this is obviously not an experience that I lived through, but it's something that I've, I've basically come to understand based on what I've read about the time, but people became less interested, general audiences and general music audiences became less interested in Orteker, uh, even general electronic music fans became less interested in Orteker, generally speaking, from Confield onwards. Um, and so Confield has had a really interesting uh, lifespan, a really interesting story, I suppose. Um, this deeply transgressive, again, that's something that I think you have to conceive whether you like the album or not, this deeply transgressive, this um, alien sounding, um, frequently dissonant and um, generally uh, unfriendly. I, I would say uh, confronting is the word I, I tend to think of when I think of this album. Yeah. A and that's that's through both like a lot of the, the sonic textures on here, a lot of the rhythms, the time signatures of these songs just being absolute nonsense and yeah uh, well that, that generally but that's that's more about the album itself and less yeah. contextual well we'll get into things like rhythms and and, yeah. and, and no. stuff as well because i i think that there is i think confield in addition to a lot of other Orteca records in this time are somewhat misunderstood um in terms of what they go for or how they actually sound but but basically what i'm getting at with my general point is that Records like Confield and the records that immediately followed it are records that most people who love now have come to later on. Have, they've have, have sort of seemed to make more sense uh, in the 2010s and in the in more recent years where you've seen the kind of fringes of electronic music bleeding into popular music um, and bleeding into popular alternative music rather. And it's almost as though you can say that, um, well, I mean, it's not even almost, you can pretty clearly say that Orteca were ahead of their time in a lot of respects. And this is a classic ahead of their time story of a record and of a sound that gets more appreciated um, in retrospect when a certain amount of time has passed and when the sound of, of alternative music, the sound of electronic music has moved in a certain direction that this record I think presages in, in certain ways. Um, and what's and what makes Ortega so great as well is that by the time that people were catching up with this record, they were still um, pushing forward relentlessly and trying to uh, refine and find new avenues for their sound and for their adventurous um, sound design. Um, but anyway, to zero in on Confield, um, yeah, so as I said, 20 years old, um, it there are we can, just, we can just drop the back to the future uh i guess you guys aren't ready for that yet but you're, yeah. you're gonna love it yeah basically that that's mm. that's, that's the age-old thing so there are so many different textures and sounds and 
atmospheres and aesthetics and whatever descriptors you want to use that you can focus in on within this record. And they all, I would argue, feel pretty utterly unique and alien. Uh, and I suppose this raises a certain question that I want to kind of kick this discussion off with. Um, and that is, is this record as significant and beloved as it is simply because it's so unlike anything else? Or is there a, a deeper attraction to Confield, do you think? I think one thing that came to mind, All Music, the um, online music publication, called this an album to respect rather than enjoy. And I want to ask what you think of that and what you think the appeal of this record is to you. It's a, it's a record to respect and rather than enjoy if you're weak and don't care for a challenge. Um, because I think that that's for me the draw with Confield overall is <clears throat> pretty much every piece on here presents an active challenge in a way. It's like you know, it's like solving a really hard puzzle in like real time as the music's playing, just trying to figure out and piece together why this works in your own brain. And, you know, big asterisk of not for everyone in the same way that, like, you know, the game, The Witness, is not for everyone. Um, you know, it's just, it, it's peculiar and deeply idiosyncratic, but, you know, that challenge that it presents is the biggest selling point because... I myself really enjoy when music challenges me just because I listen to so much of it. And I think that's another thing that sort of speaks to the, uh, but your kids are going to love it aspect is that, you know, Confield was like at the very cusp of the internet age where uh, after that point, you, you know, you get, lime wire and shit and you just so inundated with access to music of all kinds and something like uh something like this is going to stand out way more as a result of that mm. uh simply because you can find it at all you know because yeah. of that I, I think what you say about like the digital age and the the age of music becoming increasingly digitized even beyond the cd era um is I think quite interesting as well because to me a lot of the sounds of this record have a kind of digital chaos sheen to them like a real sense of like what I mean by that is that a lot of the kind of organic feel and a lot of the organic sounds and even the organ the actual organic um, programming instruments that were used on previous Orteca records in the 90s are basically all but foregone here. And, and, and you have a lot of um, stuff that uses um, software such as Max MSP, which I'll get into a little bit later on, uh, as a way of kind of like creating digital sounds and, and entirely digitized sonic landscapes that feel like a reflection of the way, like a musical reflection of the way that, that music exists as a form like in this kind of new millennium this new kind of decade if that makes sense yeah, yeah I, feel uh, like, I feel like if you were to uh get real stoned and do the sort of wizard of oz uh dark side of the moon thing with confield and kiyoshi kurosawa's pulse then that would be like you leave the plane that you're on both 2001 too yeah it's, it go. would have been right at that paradigm shift of a year for a, about eight billion reasons yeah that's a really cool comparison actually i had never thought to compare this to kind of anything that was going on in, in film at that time but i think pulse is, is um again like you had this increasing fascination and in just popular media media generally with um the digital world and the implications of a digital world on humanity, on people, on art, on whatever. Um, and I think movies like Pulse directly and music like Confield indirectly 
are kind of a part, if not commentaries on that, well, obviously Pulse is definitely a commentary on that, but if not commentaries on that, then at least like reflections of that feeling and reflections of that change that was happening. Yeah, just like a sort of, with Confield in particular, like a more impressionistic, it's almost like a, you know, a painting that reflects a certain period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and something that's always fascinated me about Confield is that I find I find myself a little confused uh, at the at the kind of general statement that it outright abandons a lot of what Autecker was going for on those those earlier records because I think rather than than completely abandoning that it more so looks at these similar ideas through a, a, a much more digital lens. Like uh, the first track, uh, Six Goes Poise, has, uh, so has soundscapes that are very recognizably something that could be equated to ambient music that's prevalent on records like Amber and Tri Repeti, but obviously done in a way that is very digital, PC, very, very different from how they would have constructed, how they would have constructed that same idea earlier in their career. But obviously this is taking new software, new mm. hardware, and, and almost reinventing that and perhaps even twisting and perverting that into... Yeah something that's much more more metallic is almost how I think of the sound of this album. It sounds metallic uh, and and perhaps some some could perhaps say say lifeless as a criticism of Confield that it, it may it may lack a certain grit or, or humanity which some people would would look for but I, I personally don't see that as an issue because I think the rhythm, the rhythm stuff here is always so consistently strong and interesting that I, I feel a, a pulse of sorts mm. from and just that. On, on the notion of, on the, on the note of the rhythm, the rhythmic elements of this record as well, just to build on what you were saying about, um, you know, it is a progression of from their 90s era as opposed to a something new entirely I, I think I fall somewhere in between those kind of polar um, viewpoints um, but uh, this is one of misunderstanding of Confield and I think of the two records that follow it as well is that they are pure uh, digital rhythmic chaos and that there's no oh, real yeah. sense of order to them and another thing that often gets said a lot that I find even more incomprehensible is that they're not melodic, which I think is just blatantly um, not true if you actually yeah. pay attention to the music. Um, but so what, what I think contributes to the vice grip that a record like Confield now has on the retrospective history of electronic music and why it's so beloved is that, yes, it, it, it integrates all of these chaotic sounding electronic elements and, and textures but they are very much anchored in reasonably steady rhythms that do shift i think what it is is that the rhythms in the on this record are in a constant state of shifting but oh, they're, yeah. ne they're yeah. never intangible um there are points on certain tracks where they do kind of like fold into themselves and kind of like collapse entirely but they either always start in a recognizable anchored place or they end there there's always a sense of order in these tracks and whether it is order that is gained or I think more frequently order that is, uh, that is the orientation at the beginning that then becomes kind of perverted or, or distorted. And I, I think a track that's, that's really interesting in that respect of, of order is a uh, sea fern because that's a track where I think it starts off very recognizably as a song that is, is a, a dance track and has a discernible rhythm, but as it goes on, that's that's perverted by these uh, quarter notes and uh, no, it's it's just perverted as it goes along, adding more and more complexity into the rhythm to the point where it it almost seems to collapse and and break down in a way I, I find very fascinating. Mm. And also it's like, yeah, there, it has one of the most, for lack of a better word, conventional rhythms at the outset oh, yeah, of the song. Yeah. But 
the texture of the rhythm is so um, just ugly. Like it's really, um, it's really just distorted percussive pattern that really like if you're wearing headphones, especially it like, it's almost painful the way it kind of smacks and, and with this real kind of, kind of tactile feel to it that I think is a nice encapsulation of the record. Whereas, yeah, there is these reasonably familiar elements, but they are being, their, their presentation, their whole style is alien. And, and yeah, that, that, that very nicely, I think, ties back into that earlier point about this being an evolution and not necessarily an abandonment. Yeah. No, that's true. Yeah, I feel like uh, the word that often comes to mind for my feelings on the album or rather the feelings that it gives me while I'm listening to it is uh, also a common criticism of music like this which is that it's cold and in response to a criticism like that I say yeah <laughs> I mean it's it, to me it feels like complaining that Dark Thrones ablaze in the northern sky is cold. Like, it's kind of, yeah, that's a little bit of the point, you know? I, I also think, like, it, it is cold, but it's more complicated than that. There's the, that's, that, that is, implicit in that is the suggestion that a record is, that there's these polar extremes cold and warm, and a record is one or the other. Whereas I yeah. think Confield is kind of both. Like, there are those cold elements to it. Like a track like Uviol, for instance, has this real icy feel to it. But then there's also like a real genuine warmth to, for instance, the melodic tones on Seafern that you hear. And I honestly, I think this is all really kind of perfected and distilled to its essence on the opening track of this record, which um, I liken to uh, everything in its right place on Kid A in terms of the effect it has and, and, and the place in the narrative of the band like it, it is this simplistic but beautiful but complicated and weirdly messy but also just gorgeous piece of music that when you when we discuss it like we have been it does start to retrospectively make sense in terms of the arc of Orteca but when you put it on it's like what the fuck is this like it's if you go from LP5 to Confield and you hear Six Ghost Poise it is like going from OK Computer to Kid A and hearing everything in its right place and thinking where did this come from uh, yeah it's 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 three it's like three main sounds across this song the main rhythm the backing that backing kind of almost tearing sound and that more ambient digital texture none yeah. of which should really work together in theory but in, in in practice the arrangement and the layering of it is so fascinating that i think i just have to find myself constantly swept up in it mm. i what, what i love so much about it i don't know necessarily that i have a favorite track on this record but i think if i had to pick one song that everyone should listen to to really understand what it's about i might actually even just pick this one because it's just so simplistic and it gets to the core of the record so neatly um i i I just, I, I adore listening to this. It, I, it opens with the quietest hint of rustling static. And then these sounds that I can only describe as um, tactile metallic raindrops start to kind of drip and splash across the soundscape. It's very vivid. It, and this is the thing with Orteca as well that I've talked about in the past is that to me, when I listen to their music, I find it very kind of visual. I find the experience really kind of, uh, I get really in my head and I'm not thinking about necessarily the, complexity of the music but i'm thinking about the just the things that it makes me imagine because there's so you can't there's so little to compare it to that as opposed to when you're listening to other forms of music and you can think of comparison points or or whatever there's so little to compare this to that you your brain or my brain at least goes purely to the realm of imagination um, to try and like process it and so yeah i get these this sense of like metallic raindrops falling in this track i like the way that they layer atop each other in the stereo channels they get quicker they get slower um another way i've heard them be described is as ball bearings circling in a metal in a metal funnel 
Um, and then something magical happens in the way this develops is after two minutes, you get that most just plaintive, simple, gentle melody that rings out behind these sounds. And it's like in that one moment, they are all just tethered together um, so uh, neatly by that. Um, they go from seeming like pure chaos to seeming like an organized embellishment of a central musical idea. Um, and so it's in this way that I think that it's the perfect introduction to this world. In many ways, I feel like it teaches you how to listen to the album. It's both an overture and an essential piece of the puzzle. And what I mean by it teaches you is that it, it distills the core of the record in a very straightforward and comprehensible way, which is that it introduces chaos and then it finds a balance within that chaos. Some tracks do the reverse, as I said earlier. Some tracks start with a balance and then give way to chaos. But either way, yeah. either way, I think this track shows you what the album is going to do. And, and, and to me personally, I, I, I tend to find when the record is working from chaos towards balance, I find those to be the more satisfying moments for me. I think that's when the album is at its very peak of performance, but I, 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 uh, I also can't say that I don't think the moments where it goes from order to chaos are, are inherently uninteresting. It's just, I, I tend to find myself preferring those mm. uh, order from chaos moments on the, on the record. Fair enough. Um, uh, one other aspect of the structure of this record that I find immensely satisfying is that to me, this album is like cleaved neatly into three thirds. Uh, the first three tracks, the second set of three tracks, and then the last three tracks, I think are cohesively of a piece with each other distinct from the other sets of three tracks, but also feel ultimately like pieces of the same puzzle such that the album really comes together. Um, and I think that there is a real particularly satisfying arc to the first three tracks where you do get that introduction to this world with Sixkiss Poise that flows neatly into the thwacking steady rhythms of Seafern that introduce this, it feels like the start of Seafern feels like machines powering up when those melodies come in. It feels like something is coming to life. And as the track goes on, it's like this thing is continuing to come to life, but it's got more and more different parts that are waking up. And it's this, it's getting huger and huger and more uh, detailed. Uh, and then that track kind of just flows right into or collides with Pen Experts, which is a big fan favorite track and, and is one of the most uh, intensely immediate songs on the oh, record, yeah. I think. And, and this, is, this is where, as I kind of talked about, I think that confrontation is most apparent in the record sound. It, it, it is a song where that, that just really uh, just more really in your face beat and kind of just grinds on you and, and could get under your skin. I find it a really exponentially satisfying track to listen to because of that. No, absolutely. I, I completely agree. It's these, I, I love the uh, size of the sounds, like the, the percussive hits in this track are not just like um, programmed drum machine hits or programmed synthesized, whatever. There's a real sense of space to them. They whoosh and they double over each other. And, and it feels almost like the beats in this song are fighting to be on top of each other. And the way the melodic counterpoint in this track is introduced is so awesome and uh, different to the way the melodic counterpoint is introduced in the previous tracks. Because in Viscous Poise, it kind of just arrives fully formed and Seifer and it's already integrated. But in Pen Experts, that melodic counterpoint uh, is basically fighting to be heard in the first part of this track. Um, this constant, uh, assault is happening with these percussive elements and and it's almost as though the the melodic tones have to claw their way through what this chaos that's happening in front of them it's see i like the way that it's that seeps in slowly it's almost like it gets pushed away with each violent thwack but it continues rising until it threatens to overtake everything else 
uh, in the track, but then crucially doesn't. Um, the intensity of this track at its peak, I think, is unlike anything else in the Orteca discography. Um, it, it, it's, it's truly like something to behold. It, it gives me chills listening to that development. So yeah, so it ends the first act of this album in this very dramatic way. Um, the track eventually kind of does fall apart, disintegrate. Though what I like about this disintegration, um, like uh, what August was saying earlier about Order From Chaos, it keeps most of the core rhythm of the song, even while that rhythm is disintegrating. It's almost like a contradiction, but it, for some reason it, it, it holds together. Um, and thus ends the first act of the album. Um, and I do think that, as I said, that this record is cleaved into three distinct acts, for lack of a better word. And I do think that each of these three acts display a different side of what Rob and Sean are trying to accomplish with this record. Um, and ultimately, yeah, what makes it such a, a marvellous, great album as a whole is the way that these three different uh, perspectives on the the musical tools of this record come together they feel distinct but interrelated um, and by the end of the record you you feel like you've come home in a certain sense as we'll get to um, so if the first third of the album uh, introduces that basic relation between order and chaos that Rob and Sean are interested in exploring then I think the second third of the album takes a much more purely textural angle uh, it looks at uh, rhythm that is already deconstructed um, and the qualities of sound. Uh, what I, one thing I think that it's interesting about this record is its relation to the D in IDM, the dance music aspect. Um, oh, yeah. For me, as an Ortega fan, as an IDM fan, as an electronic music fan, I never, my opinion is that Ortega never really forgo, forego or forgot or leave behind the dance aspect of their music even in the yeah, esoteric no, I think, 2000 stuff. I, I think you're absolutely right in that. In that, I, in that I think that it, it may go underappreciated in some online discourse, I don't really know, but I think I think the dance part of Autekar's sound is really one of their strongest aspects in that you listen to a record like this or uh, another one of my favorites, um, chiastic slide and those are records where the the rhythm and the dance and groove of the record is really put at the center of those songs and and I feel can go on a bit unappreciated if you're just sitting down in front of your computer screen listening to the song off of Spotify yeah no I, I, absolutely and I think again the genius of this album is that it continues and furthers Rob and Sean's interest in dance music and the, the, the parameters of it, but it is not exclusively interested in that. And I think that's where some of the more diverse aspects of the record kind of come into play with the second act, which kind of takes a bit of a step back from the dancier elements and again, digs purely into, it's like the, they've introduced the textual ideas that they're interested in in the first third of the record, and they've introduced them in the context of dance music for the most part, to kind of get you into the experience with some kind of familiar, tangible thing you can hang on to. Seafern being a perfect example. And then with the second third of that album, they kind of strip it away, strip some of that dance aspect away so that they can push you deeper into this world and, let, and explore this textural stuff more intimately with you and that is where i think the record gets goes from being a really interesting development of warteker's dance interests to something that is also that but is also more than that and, and yeah notably i think this this track of song this this crop of songs really foreshadows what they would go on to do on an album like draft 7.30 absolutely uh, absolutely. I have um, comments on a couple of tracks here that refer directly to that record. Um, and I'm, actually, maybe when we're finished going through some of these songs, we can reflect on that a little bit at the end. But yeah, but that, that's also a record that gets, well, actually, that record gets much less attention and, and oh, certainly, yeah. certainly which, much which, less discussion than this one. Which, which I think is notably weird. 
yeah but like um that, for instance an aside. for instance one miles will get into this now for, there is a great uh podcast on orteca called Gonkcast that i highly recommend um they've done they've covered every orteca album up to the nts sessions now and they're almost finished and they do a great job on every episode um but one notable uh, episode where i felt that i understood their perspective but i felt that they perhaps didn't quite do the record proper justice was their discussion of draft 730 where they uh, essentially, in, in more words than this, but essentially diminish that record as uh, Confield leftovers or like an attempt to do the Confield sound in a slightly different way and yada, yada, yada. And I really strongly disagree. I find that record to be very distinct from this one. Um, but that's that a, a stink. That's a stinky take. Yeah. But that's a, a discussion for another day. I just wanted to no, get yeah, it in there. That's... Good podcast, but we disagree on the on draft game. Yes, and Dan. we do. Anyway, um, so yeah, as I was saying, this new kind of section of the record, uh, and it starts off with a track that is again one of the most polarizing Orteca songs from this time. I think uh, the one of the biggest sort of growers on the on the album for me because the first time I heard it, I just couldn't understand it at all. But it's a song Sim Gishel. Uh, which I think is one of the most sickening Orteca tracks. Um, it is a disorienting, relentless uh, series of deeply embedded bass hits. It's almost like you're hearing a, the death rattle of a dance track at the back of the song. Um, it, the, 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 the main part of the song um, that's kind of underneath these really intense bass hits is sound like decaying static it's like uh washes of vaguely melodic white noise that are kind of smearing themselves across the track the whole thing has a crackle to it and a pulse that i think is almost playful in a weird sense like there's a that's also an aspect of this record that's underrated i think because people think of the coldness and the darkness and the alienness of this record is that I think there is playfulness on every Orteca record. Yeah, with, no. In beats I, I or in the textures. No, I should say, notably, I myself was, was one of these people who who initially really only appreciated the kind of, like, just how dark it was. But I think that's also part of the brilliance of this album, that it's not so easy to crack open and just... Because it's it's not just one thing emotionally. It's also this playfulness, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I think perhaps maybe that is perhaps more apparent on a record like Untilted, for instance, than this one. But I, I think I, would say so, yeah. I, I do think it's still here. Uh, it's just I think what what's different about it is that the playfulness here I think is more kind of per perverted or like um, like dark playfulness anyway um so so, so sim gishel kind of i think comes at an interesting point in the record and really pivots hard away from that dance element in a way that i think uh you used to, i used to find jarring but i've come to appreciate uh and then you get uh a really interesting track a parhelic triangle which kind of roars to life and of the three tracks in this second third of the record it's perhaps the one that has the most tangible connection to the first third of the record because it starts with this uh rhythmic loop that is at first quite steady it's very strange though um it, it sounds like it's rotating and folding and kind of uh eating itself in a weird way uh, yeah, and, if that makes and, any sense and yeah in, in the back of that you've got that like there's like this subtle little hum that kind of slowly well, starts to distort what's happening yeah yeah, it's, it's subtle at first, but it, then it eventually gets so loud. Yeah, um, and, and yeah, it, it grows. It's, it's cool. And, and what, I, what I like about this track at this point in the record is that it kind of takes that pool of decayed sound idea from Sim Gishel, and it builds on it. It examines dissonance in a really frightening way that I think does look forward to um, their next album, um, Draft 730. Um and, and this track actually has a similar structure to PN Experts, I think, though it's much simpler. That rotating chaotic rhythm, which is initially steady in its repetition, but soon starts to break apart, double on top of itself, and then just fold in completely, uh, is countered by, as you mentioned, this kind of um, metallic drone 
uh, it's not just simply that it, yeah, it gets yeah. more intense it's that it advances and then recedes and advances and it has this weird sort of back and forth in the mix tonality yeah, that, to it oh yeah that's that's true um it's almost it, like like a, a tide receding and and yeah. coming back forth yeah. yeah what it what it made me think of is um weirdly enough just that hollow tone ignoring the what's going on with the rest of the track it reminded me of the movie arrival and like the the sense of this alien technology that is giving off these resonances that are, are absolutely you can't you can't really understand and are terrifying as a result of that but it's almost like you know there is a sense of communication um that like something is trying to communicate with you but you can't get into it and that's part of the fascination of this record for me it's like the trying to understand it if that makes sense um yeah this whole this track in particular has that feel of like uh alien technology <laughs> and it just makes me really uncomfortable um however this discomfort of this track is is nothing compared to the final grace note of this album's second act, uh, which is a, a, a track that I find particularly difficult to talk about, which is the shortest track on this record called Buying. Uh, I think it's, this is maybe a bold statement considering how dense this discography is, but I think this might be the single most incomprehensible, terrifying and upsetting track that Rob and Sean have ever released. Uh, it is almost pure sound collage. Uh, almost pure chaotic, chaotic drone and percussion combination. I think this is perhaps what people think of when they vaguely recall this record and call it chaotic noise that doesn't cohere or whatever. Because this is, I think, is the one point on the record where there is a real sense of, 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 of just com being completely untethered. Um, uh, it has this... Um, Disson dissonant tonal mixture of it like these uh, these squelching swallowing um self-consuming beats um when they kind of squelch and swallow it reminds me of um the opening of a song that came later that i'm almost certain was influenced by this record which is radiohead's the gloaming off of hail to the thief it has a similar tonality at the in the in its own opening seconds um it, it's just really difficult to make sense of anything uh, and, and yeah, to, to throw an, a, another wrench into the mix, there's almost this weird, like, almost cult-like chanting hum in the background of parts of this track. Yeah, that that's a really good way of describing it, actually. I, I struggle to describe it, but that's perfect. And that also ties into another aspect of some of the drone sounds on this record is that I think Rob and Sean interestingly play with the qualities of these sounds and uh, how much they do or do not resemble the human voice. Um, and this ultimately culminates in the last track, which actually samples yeah. human voices. Which oh yeah, that, that's, that's, enough. that's a so, good, good note for the future. Cause yeah, so it's like oh, with um, the, the, these ambient pads or these drones that you get throughout the record, it is almost like, um, if you, have you guys, August, you, I suspect you might be familiar with this. I don't know if Morgan is, but uh, are either of you familiar with um, the Alvin Lucia's performance piece, I Am Sitting in a Room? I can't say. Um... Okay, so it's this audio uh, experiment that was done in the 60s. Basically, what he did was um, he recorded himself narrating a text and then he on a tape recording, and then he played it back into the room, re-recording it. And then he played that re-recording back and re-recorded it. And then he played that re-re-recording back and re-re-re-recorded it. And just did this over and over and over, I think 30 times. And what resulted from this was that the sound of his voice, the sound of the words he was saying, eventually kind of canceled itself out. And by the end, about 30 minutes into this piece, you have no recognizable human sound whatsoever. You just have these droning resonances these glistening tones that you would never think was the human voice um, and it's just the result of him looping this recording and then re-recording the as it layers on top of each on top of its on top of itself over and over and over and over again it's really worth checking out um 
yeah, all he does is just do this re-recording process and eventually the sound of the human voice is lost completely and it's just these ghostly, not even ghostly, it doesn't even sound remotely human. It's just like a glistening tone. And I feel like with a lot of the drones on this record, uh, particularly in songs like Viscous Poise and um, uh, Parhelic Triangle and Vine, uh, it has a very similar quality where it's like there's a hint of of a possible if not humanity then like a hint of like something of our world but it's like just corrupted beyond recognition and it's and it's just this echo of itself if that makes any sense um and and that's what i think is so haunting about some of the songs in this record and Bine in particular it's not just yeah. the lack of sense that it has the lack of comprehensibility it's the feeling of uh, <laughs> I'm getting really abstract here, but it's like the feeling of vague recognition as well. I don't know. It's, it really unsettles me. Um, and, and, and it's great. It's a great culmination of the second act of this record. Um, it, it feels also like a unification of everything the album has explored up to this point. Um, and particularly those last two tracks, Sim Gishel and Pahelic Triangle, because it's this notion of the soundscape as this decaying, infected thing swirling to the point where the entire track is this monolithic beast that is consuming, swallowing, sucking every sound in its grasp. Um, there, yeah, there's at least some semblance of order or, or progression on every song in Confield except this one. And I think it, it works as a, as a beautiful summary, palette cleanser and, and track in its own right. Um, yeah, I, I, I love it, even though I can't explain at all what the appeal of it is. Yeah. It, to <clears throat> to go back to the pulse parallel, um, Bind to me feels like that scene. Uh, it's like the first big scare in the movie, and it's just that really tall oh, yeah. woman up yeah. against the wall, and it's like this is this is like a normal thing, but the way that it's created makes you feel like you're like in hell it's wrong like, like it's 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 yeah. something that shouldn't that that should not be in the words of james hetfield um uh, <laughs> sorry i just had to get that in there but yeah it's, no, it, no, it's you're, acceptable. You're, you're, you're bang on that that's exactly uh the same sort of feeling that you get from from yeah. that scene in pulse and i and i think you were really oh excuse me I think you're really on point with saying how, um, like you used the word sickening to describe Vine initially. And like, I think that's pretty bang on because especially if you're playing it pretty loud, you can like feel it rattling in your lower intestine. It's yeah. like, I don't know how you got from my ears to my, 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 my digestive tract, but you're there and you're fucking everything up absolutely um and so at this point in the record um we get into the final set, final third or the final stretch of tracks and what i think um i think further evidence for my theory that this is deliberately structured into these three equal sized acts is the fact that with i did it Kaysen, the next track you have um still relatively speaking for Confield, but it returns to something approaching uh, a more conventional rhythm um, that we haven't heard the likes of since Pen Experts, although it's less uh, affronting and, and more uh, eerie in this track. So it's it, kind of it like- sounds, It sounds like, like outright delirious to me at this point. Yeah, it, it's kind of like you've, got, you've, t you've returned to some of the more, for lack of a better word, familiar, percussive um, arrangements of the first third of the record, but you have infused them with some of the uh, absolute terror of the second third of the record. You yeah, have integrated it, it, those two sections with this track. It feels like the logical emotional aftermath of Bind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is warped and twisted, uh, even for Orteker. It has these ca uh, cascading melodic tones that to me feel like a haunted carnival house. <laughs> like yeah. like like you're having a, a nightmare where you're chased by a clown or something it's 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 yeah, really but the, but the 
but the clown is like a, a fucking T one thousand or something. It's like a it's like a cyborg. Yeah, just uh, completely like not even human delirium. It's a and, robot that had sentience and then lost its mind. And, and another thing that I think is interesting about this final set of three tracks that distinguishes them is that all three of them, to me anyway, this is a very subjective thing, I suppose, but all three of them have a kind of feel of paranoia to them, um, a, a sense of something closing in uh, in the final stretch of this record. Like the opening set of three songs are expansive. They move outward. Um, they're colorful. The middle stretch of this record is, is the corruption of that, I suppose. And then the final stretch of this record is kind of like an inevitable movement towards death um and and what i what i find so interesting about this last crop of songs and and primarily the textures presented on them is that part of what's being presented is i think very inviting in a sense and very familiar but you're also still, as the point has been made of, left with the remnants of those last three tracks. Mm. And that does result in that paranoia, like that cascading, that cascading rhythm is, is nothing terribly special or unique, but it's, done, it's, it's presented against this yeah, very haunting, yeah. fucked up carnival sound, as, as you put it there's there's a real sense of like of, of of tension and progression on this track uh it's like it's almost like a, it, it it doesn't do it doesn't change as dramatically as some of the other tracks in this record although it does develop in certain clear ways but it feels almost like you're running away from something but you're also realizing that your feet aren't actually moving <laughs> like it's it's the feeling of running away but also being stuck in the same place like getting nowhere um, yeah, like and, to to run with the the sort of paranoia aspect of it. It's like, in particular, the the last track, which I'm not even gonna try to say. It's all good. We'll it's to not. It. It's not English. It's just like Henry Hill looking up at the helicopters doing bumps, just like ah, they're good. they're coming. I'm f I'm fucked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I love your, your film illusions, Morgan. They're always perfect. Um, yeah, I feel like these, I, th I, I feel like my approach to listening to instrumental music like this is to envision it as a score to yeah. something. Well, and, it's the same as what I was saying before about how when I listen to this, I just get images in my head. Um, yeah. It's the same sort of thing, except you think of like films. Yeah. Mm. Um, so yeah, a really disorienting song, which is par for the course. And then I think you get um, a really nice piece of sequencing in terms of the inclusion of Uviol, which uh, is both fitting, um, but also is like a fitting continuation of the feel of the record at this point. But it's also a bit of a reprieve as well. It starts off um, comparatively plaintive and minimal. Uh, and so it's like a really good counterpoint at this point of the record. It's actually, to be honest, it's one of my favorite tracks on the whole album. Uh, it, it immediately starts with these um, really fantastically ghostly melodic tones. These like, again, it's got that feel of like, it, like that I am sitting in a room thing where it's like, you can feel like these tones may, might once have been, been a human voice, but they're just not recognizable they just hang yeah, at the like, top and and the the tone that's like repeated in towards the beginning of it's like yeah yeah that's that, like the that's to me i envision like the humanity trying to break out of those like that's like a heart oh that's so fucking to... that's good i like that yeah, it's just it feels like a sort of it it almost feels like they they lost a fight for their humanity and they've gone dormant and whatever humanity is left is just thumping along with that uh that texture that keeps repeating mm. 
because you know it's it's almost smothered but it, you can't ignore it in any way yeah and if you were to continue on that line then the inclusion of the chopped up human voices at the start of the closing track is almost like a continuation of that it's like that fight to that fight for assertion um that is all over the record in some form but like we've been saying almost feels like it you get more sense of humanity more sense of the familiar as the record goes on ironically as it gets more twisted and dark and um you know hopeless um but yeah uvl is, is just a great uh piece of sound design in general um those uh you did done a great job of describing the actual sound itself, but even if the track were just these two elements together, this um, these ringing melodic tones and that digitized dripping um, sound, even if it was just those two, it would be a great track. But I think what really elevates it, uh, and it's emblematic of Confield, um, because this is what elevates all the songs in this record, is the progression. This is an eight minute track. And over that eight minutes, the shifts are comparatively subtle compared to some of the other tracks but they're almost more tasteful as a result of that. You get a skittering, lunging, corrupted beat just starts to lurch its way into the fabric of the piece. Uh, and it's not just that, the, those gorgeous melodic tones that vaguely resemble uh, remnants of human voices get faster. They get more varied um, and they get what I described as almost curious sounding when I was listening, but now in, on reflection of the conversation we're having, you could even describe it as desperation. Um, the, the entire track uh, has the feel to me, the image in my head is you're stranded on an ice desert planet and you're gradually becoming aware of something that you can't see stalking you. Um, it's just this tension that builds so subtly throughout the track. You can't quite put your finger on why you feel tense until you start to reflect on it as we have been doing. Um, And then you have lentic catacresis, uh, or Riley Walker is a lenticular slap. Um, <laughs> so, why? Why? Um, anyway, uh, this is the daunting closer of Confield marries every sonic idea of the eight tracks preceding it in some way. Uh, as well as feeling like a real culmination. It, it begins with what sounds like as we've alluded to, these heavily distorted vocal snippets, they're mangled beyond repetition. Uh, they get layered atop of a, a simple at first, occasionally stuttering beat and a, a deep seated melodic drone that actually of all the drones on this record, the melodic drone in the first half of this track uh, reminded me the most of some of their early nineties music, like even in Cannabula in its tonality, although it's much less analog and it's much more digitized. Um, the uh, eventually the tempo quickens and the, those progressions just fall into broken loops, reasserting themselves and failing, a machine falling apart. Uh, and then eventually there's this amazing moment in the song where everything just takes off. Um, you're galloping all of a sudden. The distorted vocal loops collapse into a, a miasma of, of static that's anchored and also violated by the beat pushing itself forward constantly. That same kind of pen experts feel on this track. Um, the background drones that I was talking about, they fall into loops, but they kind of disappear right into the back of the mix until they're almost entirely gone. Uh, all of this happens by the four minute mark of this eight and a half minute track. And then the remainder is this pure, overwhelming noise, everything all at once, the order consumed by the chaos, fragments of half melody occasionally peeking through this percussive monolith. Uh, in some respects, this track feels like a giant snowball, uh, picking up more matter and size as it continues to roll and doing so more and more quickly as the incline grows steeper and steeper. Uh, in another respect, this track almost feels like it could simulate the experience of drowning, a desperate and fruitless thrashing as your brain cells die in real time and your senses fail. For a record that is so predicated on exploring the alien, it's only fitting that it should end in such an extreme, ultimate manifestation of disorder. Uh, that drone loop from the first half of the track remains barely audible, a hint 
of a shadow of itself, deeply submerged in the mix, but it's there just enough to remind you that it existed once and it still exists if you listen close enough. And, and, and the way I've always kind of conceptualized this track in the broader uh, air quotes narrative of Confield is uh, that this is kind of the, the return to normalcy after having, having gone through all of the previous eight tracks and yet finding yourself unable to achieve that normalcy again now that you've been subjected to the album's world. And, and I kind of draw that conclusion from those, those very distorted vocal samples, that, that dissonance from humanity. In many senses, you could see that as like almost a meta microcosm for Orteker as musicians. Like they explore these different ideas and then when they try to return home to bring things full circle, they realize that they have to move forward. They have to do something different. They have to continue to, they can't stay in this world any longer. That's why their albums at this time anyway are so great and perfect to me because they really explore every avenue of a particular style uh, and then they neatly tie it off and they move on. Um, and and that, that could also be said as to why they've never tried to, to capture a train of zeitgeist intentionally, because by the time they get there, it's already going to be gone. Yeah, it's almost like the fact that they ever were uh, zeitgeisty in the mid-90s was just pure coincidence. They had a particular interest. They were certainly influenced by a lot of acts, a lot of underground acts from the 80s and in the early 90s as well. Um, they like to joke in interviews, although it's hard to say if it's a joke. It certainly reads as a joke that they convinced Warp to sign Aphex Twin. Um, but in a sense, they play with that idea of their relevance and their lack of relevance. And, and as their career goes on, they just and, and reflected in the fact that they, the interviews they give are increasingly more and more sparse. I think they gave one interview, um, I think one major interview for Sign um for an English language publication which was an interesting interview but didn't really reveal a lot and then recently they gave a massive interview um, to a Japanese newspaper <laughs> that um so that's the kind of thing that they'll do where where they will reveal themselves and they will present themselves but not necessarily in the way you expect them to and not necessarily in a way that that would fit in with traditional um presentations of, your, of, an, of a musical act I guess um, yeah, interestingly, just as a side note, Ortega are apparently reasonably big in Japan, Tom Waits style. I, I knew it was coming. Yeah. You beat me to that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, what a, a strange and um, satisfying journey this album is. Um, but before we tie this anniversary discussion off, um, one thing I wanted to also touch on, uh, I'm not sure if the two of you had a chance to listen to it, but um, Orteca released an accompanying EP. Um, oh yes, I did listen to this. Awesome. So Orteca released an accompanying EP to Confield. It actually came out a year and a half later. So the 20 years of Gantz Graf is not until August 2002, but that's fine. I think it's worth discussing or you know, mentioning alongside this record. But if, if only in brief, yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's, it's comparatively brief anyway. But and, yeah, that's, so, that's true. So this accompanying EP, Gantz Graf, apparently was actually recorded in the 90s, but um, was shelved um, because Orteker felt that it wasn't the right time to release it in their discography yet. I think it was a wise decision, despite the fact that this EP was recorded before Confield, it was a wise decision to release it after, I think, because it... it releasing it before would perhaps have and to some extent diminished the boldness of a statement that Confield is um, but I think also that Gantz Graf is a really um, superb accompaniment to that record and a development of some of its ideas uh, it's not necessarily that it when I say development it's not necessarily that it progresses Confield but it's more that it explores some similar rhythmic and digitized ideas in a way that almost works in parallel to that album rather than uh, ahead of it. So um, yeah, it's three yeah. tracks. Um, and the most notable of the three is the title track, which was um, 
which is quite a distinctive piece of music that uh, is one of Orteca's most, within the fan base anyway, one of their most known and beloved songs. Uh, the single, uh, Gantz Graf, has its own music video. Um, it is, uh, what's interesting is I basically have no idea what either of you think about these three songs really, but, but Gantz Graf, the title track, is, is a really interesting piece of music. Uh, it is basically a hyper-realized version of some of the rhythmic exploration on Confield, um, but something that also gets unspoken relatively uh, when this track is discussed is how also melodic it is. It's not just pure digitized drum bashing noise. It is very carefully structured. It almost has like a progressive um, progression to it even though it's only a four minute song and that it, it feels like it covers so much ground in that time. It, is a, it has a ridiculous BPM, obviously. Um, but it is this absolutely absurd, I think it speaks to some of the playfulness of this, of Orteca as well, because it's very, it reminds me in a certain, to a certain extent of some of the more uh, insane and warped and twisted uh, drill tracks that Aphex Twin would do, for instance, except uh, applied to Orteca's um, particular aesthetic and, and, and um, sound for this era. But um, yeah, Morgan, what do you think of this track, Gantz Graf? Uh, yeah, it's so fascinating to me that you, uh, that it was recorded in the 90s and they uh, shelved it. Uh, because to me, it feels like even more ahead of its time than confield in some ways specifically in the sense that it sounds like something off of untilted like even not even the album after directly after confield the album after that it sounds like so sort of forward thinking in that regard mm. um and you know it's documented that i fucking bang for untilted so naturally yeah. that sort of shared dna really connects it's like um we talked about the the shades of dance music that are kind of continued on confield and maybe a little undervalued and it almost feels like Gantz graph is like that is basically that perfected in a certain sense because it's a real it's i mean it's a really aggressively rhythmic track and you could really bang to it like you could properly fucking mosh to this i would i would debatably yeah. say um it has a real sense of it's, but again, it's not just a pure disembodied rhythmic chaos. It's got real order to it. When those melodic counterpoints come in, those beeps and stuff that come in about 40 seconds or so into the track, it feels like genuinely like energizing and like awesome and like awesome, not just in the cool sense, but like awesome in the like, whoa sense. And then the way the track kind of just disintegrates, but, but still maintains that sense of energy while it's doing so towards the end. It's just a fantastic like little bite-sized um nugget of of, of where all ticker we're at and i think it definitely does sound bewildering thinking about it being recorded in the 90s but you also can hear i think some of the uh metallic uh digital metallic qualities of a record like lp5 and some of the tones here it's just that it's so hyper uh, aggressive that it feels just distinct from anything else they've made up to that time and I think your connection to Untilted is really good as well because that's a record that has a similar sense of, of relentless energy and, and get to the floor and, and mosh um, <laughs> uh, to it <sighs> yeah well, just one more thing on that is like it feels to me like uh, again to connect it to visual storytelling it feels to me like a sort of Vince Gilligan style uh, montage slash you know sped up bit of footage where it's like a really w weird party that you're viewing in like you know times five speed and the way it burns out is when everybody like just crashes and goes to sleep yeah i i really do like how this this uh just really is a dance song at its core there, there's really nothing like I, I find it, it's almost almost in the structure of it. It feels a little traditional for a dance song, but what makes it Autecker is just how 
blistering and uncompromising of a song it is. Uh, I almost find it a little too short for what it's going for. I, I wish it was expanded upon more mm. because I really do like the, the, the head space it puts me into. Yeah. And, and another aspect of it that's a bit undervalued as well that I was mentioning before is, is how like it is quite melodic. Like it's quite an accessible, like once you get past the sheer quite, like heaviness of the sounds, I think it's a reasonably accessible oh, yeah. track. Yeah, for sure. That's that's comparatively definitely. Yeah, but then the rest especially, of the sorry, especially just holding it up to something from like even the more danceable tracks on Confield. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but then the rest of the EP goes in a slightly different direction, similar but different, and I think mirrors Confield more directly. Uh, Dial is this really. The second track, Dial, is this very uh, eerie, sickening um, piece of like almost glitchy uh, music. It has these um, strange, cursed melody, melodic progressions that kind of speed up and double on top of each other. It's not an amazing song, but I've come to appreciate it more and more over the years. And I think it's a little, a little underrated, maybe. Um, uh, one one thing I'd say about Dial, though, is I think the way this song uses that beat, how it's just how it has that sound where it feels like it's constantly just going up and up and up and ramping up and up. I think in a way that kind of foreshadows idatic case in in what that song does. It, it takes this kind of basic idea and I think eventually perfects that into something more fully formed. Absolutely. Well, then we'll get to the closing track of this EP, which I think is really fascinating. Um, I think it's called Cap 4. Uh, yeah, and I think on a surface level, um, the obvious comparison of this track is that structurally it is similar in the way it develops to the closing track on Confield Mentic Catacrisis. It starts with something approaching a conventional melodic progression that's quite almost ethereal that gets gradually corrupted and over ridden and just buried but i think that to say it is just another lintic catacresis is to do it a bit of a disservice because i find this track um different to listen to uniquely different to listen to and uh almost awe inspiring uh it's not a matter of preferring one or the other but i like both tracks about the same for different reasons um i like how cat four has this almost uh, I don't know how to describe the melody at the start of this track in the first part of this track. It's almost like uh, wistful and like glistening and really pretty in a way that none of the melodies, except for maybe Six Ghost Poise, most of the melodies on Confield aren't this pretty. Uh, it, it is kind of like spacey and stuff. And, and the way this track gets corroded is, is different as well. It, it feels distinctly uh harsh and like wooden almost like it almost has again some tonal similarities to lp5's uh percussive tonality where that record has a really kind of like it's definitely digital but it feels almost like organic in the quality of some of the percussion um but but yeah so th this is a really just surreal and and, and strange <laughs> closer it, it, it's almost headache inducing and i, I kind of mean that as a compliment uh, it feels like having a brain aneurysm in the last few minutes. Um, what do you um, two think of this closer of the EP? And, and... Yeah, it's sort of, I feel like with the context of knowing that it is uh, from a few years before Confield, that sort of recontextualizes this in the way that it's sort of a warm up to that where they're, you know, they're still really focused on dance beats at this point, but the the sneaking sort of, for lack of a better word, experimentation of Confield is sprinkled throughout, particularly in the, what I think are vocal samples in the background of uh, the song. There's yes. like, like that kind of stuff is like, I can see how that's like a sort of, predecessor to a lot of material on Confield mm. in that way. No, I 
Correct. Yeah, Correct point. I, I think you raise a very astute point there. And I think it also speaks to what you've said speaks to Autekar as like a, as really a group who refines their craft in a way before just shoving something out the door just to get it out the door. I, I think it really speaks to their, to a, a sense of refinement and wanting to, to nail a sound before just making a whole record and 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 such mm. i i think that this is the gantz graph ep and this closing track and the last stretch of this closing track in particular are particularly interesting if you listen to it before confield you play this song and then you play six Gus poise because one way i wrote down of describing the assault of sounds that happens at the end of cap four is that it almost sounds like wooden raindrops. Like it sounds like a relentless um, rain of, of these really heavy sounds that almost have a kind of tactile wooden feel to them for lack of a better word. And if you go back to Six Hours Poise, when I discussed that track, I described the tones in that song as being like metallic raindrops. And so it's almost like they have this idea for a sound and for a particular texture and they explore it in one way on Gantz Graph on Cap 4, where it has this real heavy uh, weight to it, um, a kind of organicness, or digital organicness for it, however that makes sense, probably doesn't. But then on Confield, it's, a, it's transposed to a different set of tonalities, a different set of aesthetics, uh, a more mechanic, <laughs> metallic um, feeling thing. So it, it does feel like you're right. Uh, in, in some respects, Gantz Graph is, is a dry run in certain respects for some of the ideas they would explore more fully on Confield, but I also find it personally to be a really cohesive uh, and exciting and interesting EP to listen to. Um, and I think its relationship to Confield shouldn't be overlooked um, as a, especially considering this was one of the up until this point in their career, they had released an EP accompanying every album, and then they would stop doing that after this record for the next few releases. Uh, and, and so it almost feels like not only is Gantz Graf a culmination, like not only is Confield like a culmination of a lot of what Orteca have been doing musically up to this point, but with this a new kind of uh, sonic approach, Gantz Graf is also like kind of the culmination of all the EPs that Orteca have made throughout the 90s that build towards this kind of like frenetic conclusion. Dope shit. Yeah. I do be agreeing. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, I think we've done a pretty fucking good job of, of breaking these releases down. So let's um, go into our favorite tracks and ratings. We'll do Confield first and then do Gantz Graf. Um, so... Um, Morgan, what are your three favorite tracks on Confield and etc.? Uh, three favorites are Six Goes Poise, uh, Sim Gishel, and uh, U Uviol. Don't have a least favorite. It's a 10. Uh, and Gantz Graf, I'll say, is an 8. Okay, dope shit. Um, August. So three favorite tracks on Confield, Confield uh, are go would have to be uh, probably Seafern, um, I'd say Vine, and Lentic, Lentic, uh, however you say it. Uh, least favorite, probably Perelic Triangle. Uh, I'd say it's however the fuck this is or eight point five out of ten. Oh shit. G yeah. uh, and and oh you're for, against graph, yeah. For Gantz graph, I'll have to draw this really quickly, but it is a seven out of ten. All right. Um, so my three favorite tracks on uh, Confield are Viscous Poise or Sixcus Poise, um, um, Pen Experts and Bine. Ugh, 
it's just so difficult to pick three. That could change any day. I think Viscous Poise is my favorite, though. I don't have a least favorite, and it's a 10 from me. So, uh, and my um, Gantz Graph uh, is uh, 9.5. I love that EP. And so uh, Confield has an average rating of 9.4, um, which puts it pretty high up, as it should be. Puts it, puts it with... Uh... Brock Hampton's Ginger, Death's Individual Thought Patterns, Clippings, Visions of Bodies Being Burned, uh, Deftones, Koino Yokan, uh, Twilight Sad, No One Can Ever Know. Dope shit. Yeah, um, I, think, I think the, uh, I think Individual Thought Patterns being among those records really speaks to something. I, I find uh, some a lot of shared DNA, or maybe not DNA, because they don't really come from the same places, but a lot of reflected uh traits in confield and something like like extreme metal albums like individual thought patterns mm. just being sort of challenging in that way well the you thank you for giving me an excuse to do this again but the the obvious comparison for me that i've made obscura. in this regard is yeah between confield and gore guts is obscura which I think do very similar things with their respective sets of musical tools. Um, so, and so Gorguts are very much um, the orticker of metal uh, in a lot of respects. So, Oh, that's my favorite sentence. It's true. Um, I believe it. Yeah, anyway. I, I, almost, I almost made a calculating infinity uh, comparison during the Confield review, so we're all... Well, that's not, again, that's not far out of off field either. Like there's definitely, I think, a metalcore sensibility to some of the percussive arrangements on this and even um, parts of LP5 as well. And Gantz Graph, notably, I would say, it's, the title track. Especially when you factor in uh, the way that both artists play with time signatures. A absolutely. Like the, the, the joke with calculating infinity is that uh, everybody in Dillinger rolled a die, rolled two dice, and picked a uh, time signature <laughs> based on what came up, and they they have uh, di discredited that bit of information. But I mean, it feels like it could be true for either group. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so yeah, let yeah. us let us know um, what you at home think of Confield and Gantz Graf. What do you think of their legacy twenty years on? Do you think anything has been made in the interim that sounds remotely like this? Um, do you think that there is some kind of antecedent or precedent for it that we didn't um, talk about? Um, just tell us your feelings. Let us know what you think. What's your favorite Orteker album? Let us know that too uh, in the comments below. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Well, August, do you have one? Yeah, you do. I, I do. As always, folks, uh, rock over London, rock on Chicago, triple A. Travel with someone you trust. <laughs>